In this video, we describe the Schrodinger equation. All right, so uh, in our prior videos, we have introduced the concept of quantum mechanics. And one of the most important aspects of uh, quantum mechanics is that it only really applies to very small particles, like electrons or very light atoms. Uh, for macroscopic objects, then uh, quantum behavior can be, can be neglected generally. Now, the problem is then that we have these very small particles that exhibit quantum uh, behavior. For example, they can diffract. Um, and the question is, well, how can we then understand uh, those particles? What is the type of equation that we can use to model uh, the behavior of those particles? Okay? Classical mechanics is not going to work anymore because, again, these particles behave like waves. Uh, there's this dual uh, duality between wave and particle, and that's something that classical mechanics fails to account for. Right, so uh, then the equation that we're going to use to uh, study those uh, uh, particles that have wave properties is the Schrodinger equation, which has this form. All right, so let's uh, explain what each of the terms uh, in, the wave, uh, in this wave equation mean. This is something that we call the Hamiltonian operator, and it's simply a bunch of mathematical opera uh, operations that we're going to describe in just a little bit. Okay, this is a wave function. And uh, that's what contains the wave properties of the particle, or actually any type of properties of the particle. Uh, so all of the behavior of the particle is going to be contained in this wave function. This is the energy of uh, that particle, and that is the wave function again. Now, something that uh, you might be tempted to do is simply to cancel these wave functions, say that the Hamiltonian operator is equal to the energy. But that is not the case, because the way to read this equation is uh, the Hamiltonian operator is just a bunch of mathematical operations that when you apply to the wave function will return the energy multiplied by the wave function. Okay, so sometimes this Hamiltonian operator has a hat or something like that to signify that again these are just operations that you have to apply to the wave function and when you do that you will get the energy multiplied by the wave function. Okay, so that's why you can cancel this. There's not a product here Okay, is just apply all of these um, uh, mathematical operations to the wave function to obtain uh, the energy multiplied by the wave function. All right, so then the question is, well, uh, how do we actually write this Hamiltonian operator? The Hamiltonian operator has two terms, one that is kinetic, which we're going to call it T, and one that is going to be a potential uh, operator. The kinetic uh, energy term of the operator depends on how many directions the particle is moving. Okay, generally, particles are going to be moving in three directions of space, x, y, and c. But in some cases, we might confine the motion of the particles to just one dimension or two dimensions. Right? So for one dimension, then this Hamiltonian operator has this form. It's going to be equal to minus h bar squared over 2m, second derivative with respect to the direction of motion. Okay, so this is what these uh, uh, operations mean. What you have to do to obtain the kinetic energy of that particle, okay, is to take the second derivative of the wave function with respect to the direction of motion. Let's assume that this is just motion only the x-axis. And then after you take those second derivatives, then you multiply by uh, Planck's constant, h bar, okay, this is uh, Planck's constant over 2 pi, okay? divided over 2, uh, and then times the mass of the particle. Okay, this is how the motion, uh, the kinetic energy for the motion in one direction will be. Okay, we have two dimensions, for example, x and y. This does not get very complicated. This is simply, simply uh, you have to add the second derivatives with respect to the other direction. And then you, if you have three-dimensional motion, as, like most particles will, then this simply reduces or, or expands to include the motion along the three directions. Okay, well, this is hard to see. You have to believe it when I say that, uh, again, if you uh, apply all of these operations to the wave function, what you will obtain is the kinetic energy of that particle multiplied by the wave function. That's how this equation operates. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy term of the Hamiltonian operator. Then we also have to talk about the potential energy term, but this depends on the system. For example, if we're thinking about an electron in an atom, say a halogen atom, Okay, uh, uh, that potential term would account for the attractions between the electron and the positive charge in the nucleus. Okay, so uh, I will, uh, we will see how this uh, potential energy term uh, develops as we actually see concrete examples. But for now, 
Again, it's just going to be a bunch of mathematical operations that apply on the wave function, and that is going to return the potential energy multiplied by the wave function. Okay, so that's uh, uh, all about the Hamiltonian operator. What about the rest? Uh, well, we have the wave function. And the wave function uh, is something that we will uh, learn to understand as we move along. But for now, again, uh, uh, suffice it to say that it's going to be able to describe uh, the properties of this particle, the behavior of this particle. Again, and this applies to a particle that has wave properties. Okay, so electrons, uh, small particles that have quantum behavior. All right, so as we move along, we will discover that uh, the uh, wave function, psi, is related to the probability for uh, the particle being in a region of space. Okay, so evaluating uh, uh, the wave function in uh, a region of space is related to uh, having a probability, how, how probable it is to find a particle in that region of space. For that reason, we actually have some constraints on what type of functions uh, are good, good matches for a wave function. Okay, so uh, what has to happen is that the wave function, if you say, well, I suppose that this particle only moves in one axis, it has to be single valued. That means that functions like this actually will not uh, be possible because you have uh, the particle at a distance x, the value of the wave function would be this and that. Okay, but because the wave function is related to the probability and you can't have two probabilities of finding the particle in the same region of space, wave functions like these actually can't can happen. So the, the wave function has to be single valued, only one value uh, in one region of space. Okay, it also has to be continuous. Okay, so um, uh, wave functions like these, where this goes to infinity and then the wave function returns, that actually is not going to work because notice that when we apply the Hamiltonian operator, we actually have to take uh, uh, second derivatives, right? So the second derivative here at, at infinity is, is ill-defined and, and again, these are not reasonable wave functions. Okay, finally, the wave function has to be uh, smooth. Okay, so, uh, and, and usually also what's going to happen is that uh, occasionally we're gonna have to describe uh, a wave uh, uh, behavior. Okay, so uh, typical wave functions might look like this, for example, that would be a wave, uh, good wave function, or maybe it might look like this, okay, or it might look like this. Okay, all of these functions are uh, continuous, uh, smooth, and single value. Okay, so to just write a few of potential uh, wave functions, uh, they can have this form. For example, an exponential form is actually a good uh, uh, model for what a wave function should look like. These are just constants, A and K are constants that would come from solving the equation. Okay, so an exponential function would, be, would look like this. Then we also have that uh, sine and cosine functions might also be good functions. Okay, sine kx, for example, where a and, a and k are, are, are constants, those also could be uh, reasonable wave functions. Okay, so a sine function looks like this. Okay, it's a periodic function that is smooth, uh, single valued, uh, and it does ne never, it's continuous, it never goes to infinity. Okay, cosine would be uh, also a reasonable uh, wave function. Okay, cosine is just the uh, same as, as the sine, but offset. Okay, and there are others. For example, uh, a Gaussian function is also a reasonable wave function. Here we're just providing examples for how these wave functions are going to work. For now, we don't understand exactly how the behavior of the particle is, is uh, uh, coded into the, these wave functions, but that's something that we'll learn in future videos. Okay, so, all right, we've talked about the Hamiltonian operator, we've talked about the wave functions and some of the restrictions that we have on what type of functions are going to be uh, uh, put in here, and then we just have that we have to talk about the energy. It will turn out, as we will see when we solve uh, a couple of models, that when we solve this expression, okay, we apply the Hamiltonian operator to functions that are like this, what is going to happen is that our energy expressions, okay, for the energy of the particle, these energies are actually going to be quantized. Okay, what that means is that this equation is only possible when you actually have something that we call here an uh, integer number, a quantum number, which sometimes we will call uh, n, sometimes we will call v, uh, sometimes we call j. This depends on the, uh, on the model. Okay, n is fairly common. But the most important thing is that these quantum numbers, okay, they're all integers. Okay, so they can only have the values 1, 2, 3, 4, sometimes 0. Okay, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to infinity. 
that uh, the equation will never be able to be solved if you have a value that is not integer. So it's this quantum number that appears in the energy expressions is fractional, like 1.1, 1.2, then the equation does not have any solutions. Okay, so only uh, 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 integer quantum numbers that will appear uh, both in the energy and in the wave function, those are the ones that actually solve this Lambert equation. Okay, and this is something that is fundamental to quantum mechanics because, again, it reconciles the factor that energies are actually quantized discrete in the quantum world. And again, this is uh, in distinction to what happens in the macroscopic world where all of our energies are continuous. Okay? So this, uh, this is essentially an introduction to the uh, Schrodinger equation, which is what we're going to be using to uh, understand the behavior of quantum particles like electrons and atoms. And again, this is just an introduction. Uh, we're going to see how all of these terms play out when we actually uh, uh, apply it to uh, some model systems that are coming up in the future.